Thank you all uh, for coming to our uh, tonight's faculty lecture. Before we get started, I have just a couple of announcements. Um, the first one is about our uh, email list. If you are not on our email list that, um, to get uh, notifications of upcoming talks and would like to be on the email list, please um, write your name and your email address on this sheet, which will be here available at the end of the talk. Um, also, our other announcement is the next um, faculty lecture is October 22nd. Danny Ladoni will be talking about documentary film ethics. And there are a few flyers here if you are interested. Okay. Okay. So with that, uh, I'd like to have you join me in welcoming Dr. Nick Sines of the Black Legend and Hispanic History, Ben and Matt. Well, uh, by, by way of introduction, I should probably begin by saying thank you for coming this evening. I know there was a, a very uh, important meeting this night for the Colorado Commission on Higher Education uh, that will impact the campus quite significantly. So I'm really happy that you chose to be here uh, with me this evening. Um, well, uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to speak this evening on a subject near and dear to my pre second professional life as a scholar of Spanish history. Although it is my life as an educator that consumes the bulk of my professional passion, it is the study of the Hispanic world that first drew me to the idea of pursuing a life in the academy. Before continuing much further, I should probably note that the use of Hispanic in the title of this e evening's presentation was a conscious one on my part. I did not use it as a stand-in for Chicano, Hispano, Mexican-American, Latino, or various other denominators of Spanish-speaking communities of the American Southwest. My aim is actually rather larger in scope and seeks to bridge my understanding of the history of peninsular Spain and what are, I hope, some thoughtful observations, if at times rather impressionistic, on the cultural environment and contemporary history of the United States. In this sense, I have invoked the word Hispanic to speak on a subject that spans the history of Spanish speakers on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean merging together the world of early modern Europe with that of present-day America. Now, the tradition of the academic lecture is somewhat of a dying breed these days. As a professor at my alma mater once remarked to a room of entering freshmen, quote, a full-length formal talk, talk on a set topic is a rather 19th century kind of thing to do. Well, as it so happens, I'm really rather fond of the 19th century. Uh, so much so that I've committed years of study to the topic, uh, and as my students might have noticed, uh, I tend to turn to it quite often in passing reflection. That said, my focus this evening is not on the 19th century. At least not specifically, but I promise to get there before the evening uh, is over. In my reflections on what to present this evening, I was struck by the opportunity at hand. Carl L. Becker, an exceptional historian active in the first half of the last century, insisted that good history ought to serve a public function and adapt to the social necessities of its time. Historians, he argued, should seek to make the past relevant to the world of the present. To this end, I have prepared remarks on a historical topic that I believe has everything to do with the realities of the contemporary world. This evening, I submit to you that La Leyenda Negra, that is, the black legend, is alive and well in the present. This evening, I invite you to consider but one way in which the force of history continues to exert its influence on the world in which we live. As a starting point, I should begin by explaining how history is written. There's an old adage that history is written by the victors that socio-cultural elites and persons with economic means actively conspire to craft historical narratives that legitimize their standing in the world or work in the service of enacting particular political agendas. This is certainly the case, although I would like to believe uh, that there exists another standard among the ranks of professional scholars of history. History like other academic disciplines, is built around a set of professional standards. None of these standards remain more inviolable than the need for hard evidence to ground sound argumentation. In the case of history, this means turning to the documents. Written and, let's try that again. 
<laughs> All right. So turning to the documents, written and composed by contemporaries of the historical events and time periods under examination. Only through the examination of valid primary source material can historians attempt to reach sound con conclusions about the past. Of course, historical inquiry by scholars can also function uh, historical inquiry by scholars can also focus on the work of secondary sources written by persons with access to primary sources of their own. The process of writing history, then, inevitably is tied to the examination of long-standing historical narratives, what earlier generations had to say on a subject. It should not be surprising to discover that many of these older narratives find their way into newer histories, both of a professional and popular sort, and unwittingly steer the course of how authors write history in the present. Let us consider the idea of historical narrative in more detail. Historical narratives are, in their essence, stories about the past. But these stories are not created in a vacuum. Historical narratives are the product of layers of interpretation produced by, in many cases, generations of historians and non-historians alike, which are, in turn, molded to suit needs of the present and the many shifting vagaries of memory. Historical tropes, uh, historical tropes provide a neat framework for envisioning how stock ideas serve to influence the writing of historical narratives. At the most basic of levels, tropes are recurring ideas, or figures of speech which provide metaphorical significance to otherwise mundane narratives. Common tropes at work in the family narratives of American families include the model of the aspiring immigrant, the image of the self-made man, and the journey from rags to riches. Consider your own family narratives. How different do you imagine your parents' accounts of family history are from those of their parents? How can we account for such shifts in narrative. Why do these stories change at all? As humans, we are susceptible to trends of social fashion, to the conscious and unconscious need to construct our identities in the present with a clever nod to a kind of imagined past and, of course, the need to fit in. In some cases, the narratives of others and of society in general terms provide a framework for constructions of indiv individual historical narratives. This, this works at a much larger level as well. The black legend is a kind of historical trope that has influenced a succession of historical narratives written about Spain, Spaniards, and Spanish-speaking peoples more generally. Indeed, I argue it survives today as one of the oldest narrative constructions still in use. The phrase black legend was coined in the early 20th century by a Spanish scholar named Julian Juderias, whose 1914 book, La Leyenda Negra y la Verdad Histórica, The Black Legend and Historical Truth, bore the altogether too wordy subtitle of Contribución al Estudio del Concepto de España en Europa, de las causas de este concepto, y de la tolerancia política y religiosa en los países civiliza civilizados, uh, or uh, roughly translated as contribution to the study of the concept of Spain in Europe, of the causes of this concept, and of political and religious tolerance in civilized countries. Reading between the lines of the subtitle, so to speak, it is evident that Juderías found the idea of Spain as it existed in the minds of other Europeans to be in a deplorable state. Indeed, northern civilized Europe, the industrial and economic regional core, lacked a basic tolerance for all things Spanish. In the assessment of Juderías, this owed to a particular image of Spain crafted centuries before. To understand the world in which the black legend originated, we must go back in time to the late 15th and early 16th centuries, an era of religious controversy that coincided with the early settlement of the New World. Before turning to the religious situation in Europe, I wish to first reflect for a moment on the Spanish colonial project in the Americas. The immediate post-conquest period witnessed a massive and near catastrophic decline 
of indigenous populations throughout the Western Hemisphere. Some scholars place the figure as high as 90%. This decline was coupled with a brutal program of enslavement that further decimated the ranks of survivors. Only through the polemical intervention of the Spanish Dominican friar, Bartolomé de las Casas, was this program reversed and a more moderate system of rule instituted in its place. Nonetheless, the writings of Las Casas fueled attacks by relative imperial upstarts like England, which attempted to thwart Spanish expansionism in the New World. One of the first English language reprints of the Las Casas text bore the title, listen to the wording here, Popery Truly Displayed in Its Bloody Colors, or a faithful narrative of the horrid and unexampled massacres, butcheries, and all manners of cruelties that hell and malice could invent, committed by the popish Spanish party on the inhabitants of West India. Such writings, used, so, such writings proved a useful purpose for later English propagandists. Spain was, after all, one of the unquestioned great powers of Europe by the close of the 16th century and a constant fixation of the English. The sudden rise of Spain came about through the confluence of several key events in the late 15th century. Uh, the marriage of Isabella of Castilla and Fernando II of Aragon joined the most prosperous realms of the Iberian Peninsula into one in 1474, a date sometimes associated with the birth of Spain as we know it today. Within two decades, this partnership brought an end to nearly 800 years of Muslim rule in southern Spain with the defeat of the small kingdom of Granada in 1492. By chance, this year also marked the first of Christopher Columbus's voyages to the Americas. At the close of the 15th century, Spain stood astride major markets of trade that knitted together the Mediterranean and Atlantic worlds. As luck would have it, Isabella and Ferdinand's daughter married a member of the Habsburg family. Their son, the future King Carlos I of Spain, would go on to hold simultaneously the office of Holy Roman Emperor, thereafter styled Charles V. Under the rule of Charles V, the Habsburg monarchy came the closest of any royal dynasty to the goal of achieving universal monarchy in the era between Charlemagne and Napoleon Bonaparte. In this period, no other strategic, out, no other strategic priority outshun French Bourbon military strategists than staying one step ahead of the Habsburg pincer movement. Against the threat of Europe's political domination by an avowedly Catholic Habsburg ruler stood the very survival of the Protestant religious movement. The Reformation, initiated by the 1517 publication of Martin Luther's famous 95 Theses, set off a firestorm of religious conflict in Europe. In the resulting political contest between Catholic and Protestant Europe, Spain was the unquestioned champion of the Vatican in its attempt to stamp out heresy. In this environment, political strife had the potential to take on religious significance. Nowhere was this more evident than in the Spanish Netherlands, where an independence movement that became the so-called 80 Years War emerged around the efforts of Dutch Protestants to free themselves from the cruel and oppressive grip of Spanish Catholics. The propaganda war launched in the wake of this conflict sheds insight on the Protestant vision of Spanish activity in the New World. The prints of Dutch Calvinist Jan Theodore de Brie are exemplary in this regard. And what I have here, um, this is a, you'll note that there are a number uh, of images of this kind, but I, I want to sort of draw your attention uh, to just a few uh, in detail. If you look closely at what you see, um, of course, this is not a style of uh, artistic depiction that you would see today, so you might have to kind of look in deeply. But essentially what's being presented here is, is a bunch of, uh, oh, try that again. Spanish Catholics up here on top, essentially torturing the indigenous peoples of the New World, throwing them to the wolves. Uh, another image here, you'll notice uh, there is uh, an indigenous woman who's essentially either hung herself or been hung uh, alongside her child. 
uh, and the Spanish are essentially seen to be feeding uh, children to wolves. Uh, in the background, you see some pretty uh, brutal uh, things going on as well. Uh, again, all of this is targeted towards cultivating an image of the Spanish as particularly cruel, bigoted in their imposition of uh, Spanish Catholicism in the New World. And lastly, one here, again, uh, sort of a, a baby killing image alongside a Spaniard fanning the flames of uh, some already killed uh, indigenous people who have, who have recently been hung. So this is the sort of imagery that's circulating around Europe in this period in the, con in the context of uh, the Reformation. So England was the strongest supporter of the Dutch. When Felipe II admitted, attempted to derail this alliance in 1588 by means of the famous Spanish Armada, an English victory at the hand of foul weather in the English Channel was taken as a sign of divine providence. God had clearly ordained a crushing defeat for the Spanish. The English were now on course to inherit Spain's standing as a major world power. In the conception of most Englishmen, this turn of events was punishment for Spain's promotion of religious bigotry, its pretensions towards political domination of Europe, and the inherent twin qualities of cowardice and cruelty shared near universally by all Spanish Catholics. Contrast to this vision of a monolithic Spain, the English portrayed themselves as the defenders of political and religious freedom. A special note in this framework is also the emergence of a popular image of the Spanish Inquisition. Founded in 1478 as an arm of the state, the Spanish Inquisition was exceptional in that it stood apart from the Vatican and served at the will of the Spanish monarchy. Turn to the business of rooting out crypto-Jews after the Jewish expulsion of 1492 and later crypto-Muslims after the Muslim expulsion of 1610, the Spanish Inquisition deserves much of the infamy associated with it. However, it is worth noting two things. First, it was not unique for its time. Inquisitorial tribunals were established under canon law throughout Europe. Yet from the promotion of Monty Python skits to Mel Brooks sing-alongs, uh, but two well-known and often recited cultural influences, the Spanish Inquisition is now indelibly tied to the image of early modern Spain and the English-speaking world. Second, the reprehensibility of the Jewish and Muslim expulsions aside, Spain was not the only country to expel religious minorities from its borders. Although it is rarely mentioned, King Edward II, or excuse me, Edward I of England issued an edict of expulsion for England's Jews in 1290 that remained in force until 1657. Of course, English Jewry paled in comparison to the size of Spain's medieval Sephardic community. It is worth noting, if only in passing, that apart from the Spanish Inquisition, the contribution, contributions of Spaniards to world history during the early modern period ought to include the early intellectual foundations of modern democratic theory, impressive scientific expeditions, and perhaps even the formulation of capitalism as an economic theory in advance of Adam Smith. Estimates now suggest that many more persons died as a direct result of Protestant attacks on Catholic communities than by the Spanish Inquisition. It's always a matter of personal bewilder bewilderment to me when I hear about another popular romance or movie dramatizing the glamorous world of court life during the reign of Henry VIII. Henry VIII likely put to death upwards of 70,000 Catholics in an effort to suppress resistance to his English Reformation. His reign was one of the more brutal episodes in English history, and yet there exists a cottage industry today that celebrates the era of his rule as one of mild religious controversy and suspenseful intrigue. By contrast, Mary I, Catholic Mary, the daughter of a Spanish queen, often remembered as Bloody Mary, likely executed no more than 300 persons. To put those numbers in perspective, deaths directly attributable to the Spanish Inquisition over the centuries of its existence probably numbered no more than 5,000. Of course, deaths aside, a much larger number of persons were interrogated, sometimes regularly, and many others lived under constant fear or threat. However, the number of dead due to religious violence on the part of Protestants climbs to considerably higher still when statisticians take into account the witch hunts that wreaked havoc in Europe during the 16th century. 
Whatever the toll in dead, my role here this evening is not to apologize for Spanish behavior in the Americas or the Holy Office. There is much to criticize about 16th century Spain and its imperial reach. In many places, Spanish rule was genuinely quite cruel and Spanish clerics were unabashedly bigoted. What remains striking all the same is the extent to which such an image remains tied to historical conceptions of Spain and Spanish speakers. Despite countless despicable colonial atrocities in Africa and Asia, consider how often British and French history is called into account in the same way. The answer is hardly at all. What's more, the legacy of the black legend had real durability in the context of early modern Europe. Indeed, it proved quite malleable as well. It appears most, or this appears most evident in two regards. In the first place, the black legend contributed to the idea that Spaniards lacked a natural propensity for all things scientific. Writing in 1792, French writer Nicolas Masson de Morvillet asked, quote, what do we owe to Spain? In two centuries and four or even six, what has Spain done for Europe? In response, he insisted that Spain was undoubtedly, quote, the most ignorant nation in Europe. In framing his diagnosis of the problem, Masson asked another question, quote, what can we expect of a country that needs to ask priests for permission to read and think? For a long time, few in the academy acknowledged the very idea of a scientific revolution uh, that took place in Spain and far-flung outposts of the Spanish Empire. The early modern Spanish world was often derided by professional academics as a stagnant intellectual environment. This view persisted despite the fact that much of what Europeans knew about the New World came from the accounts of Spanish explorers, doctors, and scientists. One need only visit the gardens of Seville to encounter the place in which many botanical specimens were planted in European soil for the first time until the advent of penicillin in the 20th century, one of the world's most popular medicinal agents was quinine, a crystalline alkaloid derived from the bark of the Cinchona plant, uh, Cinchona plant, excuse me, endemic to the Andean region of South America. Knowledge of, the, knowledge of Cinchona's medicinal properties, particularly useful in combating malaria, was brought to Europe via Spanish channels. Spanish natural philo philosophers made advances in other areas as well. In the second place, the black legend aided, Spanish, er, aided European detractors in speaking of a poor Spanish work ethic. Although Spaniards first evinced a belief in, of themselves of ha as having fallen behind the rest of Europe during the 18th century, and consciously looked to the rest of the continent for guidance, Northern Europeans ran with this idea. As one English commenter put it, quote, Spain in the general is a large garden of butterflies or rather a hive of idle drones, where neither wit nor industry is encouraged. A Spaniard is a sort of amphibious animal that is neither fish nor flesh, nor good red herring. It is neither fool nor knave, but both. That has more pride than merit, that has more impudence than a dozen of watermen, more conceit than six country squires, and as much courage as a goose. Such disdain for the Spanish work ethic was evident in the early 19th century as well. British forces in the Iberian Peninsula, fighting alongside Portuguese and Spanish soldiers to oust the armies of Napoleon, largely credited themselves with victory. Sir Arthur Wellesley, the commander of British forces in the peninsula and the future Duke of Wellington, was notorious in his dislike of the Spanish. A variation on the idea of poor Spanish work ethic with its roots in Catholicism was found in Max Weber's famous text, uh, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. This text, by one of the pioneers of modern sociology, credited Protestantism with facilitating the emergence of modern capitalism. The product of a strict Calvinist upbringing, Weber celebrated the moral and ethical teachings of Protestant Protestantism as a counterpoint to the decadence of Catholicism. While Weber's ideas neatly explain the rise of England and Germany as Europe's great commercial and industrial powers, it failed to really explain why it was that France and Italy eventually joined them. In any event, the uneven and irregular modernization of Spain over the course of the very long 19th century offered a persuasive case for consilience to surviving defenders of the black legend. <clears throat> 
Turning now to the resonance of the black legend in contemporary American society, is, it is worth noting that British colonists brought a particular image of Spain, crafted in the 16th century, to the Americas. Harkening back to the religious conflicts that greeted the birth of Protestantism, this image ca cast Spanish Catholic culture as inferior to that of English Protestantism. English language propaganda from the 16th century informed the development of views towards the Spanish monarchy and later Mexico for colonists in British America and what would ultimately become the United States. In fact, an image of the cool and rapa rapacious Spaniard was presented as a stark contrast to Puritan myths of the first contact, like that of the first Thanksgiving, which presented a narrative of harmony and mutual benefit for both societies, one that no Native American tribe would acknowledge today. In reality, English history was crafted in the interest of imperial ambitions. It was also the case that a vision of the United States' place in the world was constructed in a similar manner. Proponents of Manifest Destiny viewed the future of the United States in providential terms. This was all the more apparent in the 19th century as Spanish empire waned at the dawning of American imperialist ventures in, Western, in the Western Hemisphere. As British educated professor Felipe Fernandez Armesto uh, explains, quote, the areas that had formerly housed the great civilizations of the Americas continued to do so in colonial times. The biggest cities, the greatest wealth, the densest populations, the most conspicuous achievements in art, thought, and science were still concentrated where the traditional indigenous civilizations had flourished. In colonial times, American disparities seemed to favor areas colonized from Spain and Portugal. During the short period of 1810 to 1824, Spain lost its territorial holdings on the American mainland, retaining only the islands of Cuba and Puerto Rico and the, Cuba and the Caribbean. As Fernandez Armesto explains once again, quote, in every department of economic life, the countries of Latin America receded in relative stature, while the United States towered. The educational institutions of Latin American countries, which had produced scholars and scientists of great eminence in the colonial era, stagnated, while some of those of the United States rose to what would now be called world class. A similar reversal characterized the arts. Above all, by the crudest and most effective measure of success, the United States became an unbeatable power in war in its own hemisphere and bade fair to challenge the powers of the old world. These challenges amounted to an inversion of what had previously been American normalcy. The common history of the hemisphere became divergent, and the centers of initiative shifted to the formerly unfavored North. In short, the United States was both a relative newcomer to the history of um, the Americas, and at least at the start of the 19th century, still something of a cultural backwater. Ultimately, however, the rise of the United States in the 19th century was to become one of the more meteoric in world history. Against the backdrop of commercial and industrial prosperity for the early United States, Spain was something of a curiosity. Spanish empire had once proven a real threat to the survival of British colonial dominions in North America. During the colonial era, knowledge of Spain derived primarily from English and Scottish writers such as John Campbell, William Robertson, and Adam Smith, and from sermons, those of Cotton Mather and Samuel Sewell regularly bashed Spain, that were inspired by the black legend and represented the dark side of Spain and its people. This ought, to not, this ought not to be all that surprising. At the start of the 18th century, British and Spanish military forces fought for control of Florida and Georgia in what Americans call Queen Anne's War, better known to Europeans as the War of Spanish Succession. Hostilities between the British and Spanish continued throughout the 18th century over control of the Caribbean. This was much the case when Spain sided with the fledging republic in what became the American Revolutionary War. Spain's support for the 13 colonies was key to securing their independence from the British crown. From Louisiana, then under Spanish rule, Spain launched attacks on British garrisons along the lower Mississippi Valley and the Gulf Coast strongholds of Mobile and Pensacola. Spanish capture of the Bahamas in May 1782 forced the British to reconsider their decision to prolong the war after Cornwallis' surrender to Washington at Yorktown a year earlier. Nonetheless, Spain's part in securing U.S. independence has, has been nearly forgotten and certainly pales into comparison to that of the French, whose physical presence at Yorktown has proven harder to forget. 
Before the century was out, Spain's contribution to the American Revolutionary War was dismissed by the Continental Congress's man in Madrid, none other than, than future Supreme Court Chief Justice and co-author of the Federalist Papers, John Jay, who had little kind to say about Spanish culture. Spain's contribution to the American Revolutionary War wholly ignored, during the 19th century, Americans went about reframing an image of Spain that built upon the biases and cultural stereotypes prevalent during the colonial period. As Jonathan Brown has made clear, quote, our image of Spain was created by a Protestant intellectual and social elite centered in Boston and New York in the first half of the 19th century. United by time, place, and outlook, the creators of the American image of Spain, William H. Prescott, George Ticknor, Washington Irving, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, largely agreed that Spain had been frozen in time by its slow pace of modernization. These were not historians in rigorous conformity with the standards of the contemporaries I described at the outset. While these men, in most cases, traveled to Spain in an effort to acquire appropriate grounding for their historical narratives, they did not conduct the kind of extensive primary source research that would be required for publication in the academia of today. Indeed, that standard had not been yet formalized. Instead, they relied extensively on the works of other English language sources. In doing so, they inherited much of the cultural baggage of the 16th century world. Prescott, in particular, framed the history of Spain as a sort of moral lesson for the people of the United States. In Prescott's historical accounts, the decline of Spain served as, as a sort of warning for what lay ahead should the United States stray from its principles. As Richard L. Kagan has observed, Prescott's paradigm clearly just juxtaposed the rise of the United States with the decline of Spain. For one country to succeed in the world, the other clearly had to fail. Although more balanced accounts were presented by Mordecai M. Noah, Alexander H. Everett, Severn, Teckel Wallace, and Bernard Moses, these clearly lost out to the more sensational. The narrative of Prescott and those like him largely carried the day. El Desastre of 1898, what Americans know better as the Spanish-American War, only confirmed Prescott's view of history in the minds of many Americans. The Spanish cession of Cuba, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico to the United States then emerging as a major world power, added a dramatic capstone to the Prescottian vision. Well before the outcome of 1898, Americans had already come to associate a particularly English conception of Spain with their neighbors to the north, or neighbors to the south, I should say. This was especially evident in the era of the US war with Mexico. In the retelling of, quote, a conversation between two persons of apparent gentility and intelligence, overheard while en route from Rochester to Victor, New York, the famed abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, recounted a chance encounter between two Americans. And his story goes largely like this, quote, the main argument in favor of the war was the meanness and wickedness of the Mexican people. And to cap the climax, he gave it as his solemn conviction that the hand of the Lord was in the work, that the cup of Mexican iniquity was full, and that God was now making use of the Anglo-Saxon race as the rod to chastise them. In an editorial published in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, referencing the Alamo and Goliad massacres, Walt Whitman channeled a similar contrast between Americans and Mexicans, quote, we have dammed up our memory of what has passed in the South years ago, of the devilish massacres of some of our bravest and noblest sons, the children not of the South alone, both of the North and West, massacres not only in defiance of ordinary humanity, but in violation of all the rules of war. Who has read the sickening story of those brutal wholesale murders so useless of any purpose ex except gratifying the cowardly appetite of a nation of bravos, that is, bandits and assassins, willing to shoot down men by the hundred in cold blood without panting for the day when the prayer of that blood should be listened to, when the vengeance of a retributive God should be meted out to those who so ruthlessly and needlessly slaughtered his image. 
Of particular consideration, note that both of these episodes, the one recounted by Frederick and Whitman's editorial, come from the northern United States, New York in both cases, not the slave-owning South, which is so often portrayed as unique in 19th century America and the years leading up to the Civil War. The reality was that fervent dislike of Mexicans was widespread among Americans of all US states, and that this hate stemmed from a notion of the people they conquered as inherently inferior. In the San Luis Valley, the social status of Chicanos was not molded exclusively by Eastern encroachment from the Protestant urban enclaves of the industrial Atlantic. Permanent settlement of the valley began in earnest during the 1850s, with settlement of the Conejos and Sangre de Cristo land grants in the region that today forms the borderlands of southern Colorado and northern New Mexico. Already a refuge of the persecuted, the valley witnessed a second wave of permanent settlement with the arrival of LDS settlers that began during the 1870s. However, it was a round of Dutch settlement that began in 1892 that yielded the greatest likelihood for ethnic and potentially racial conflict. Much in the same way as English ideas influenced early American conceptions of Spain and the Spanish-speaking world, Dutch immigrants from the old world were raised in an educational milieu that framed the religious world of 16th century Europe as an appropriate one for viewing the present. At least locally, it seems old world narratives built around the black legend would have framed engagement between long-standing Chicano communities and their Dutch neighbors. Yet this does not appear to have been the case. Modes of inter-ethnic interactions in this case appear to have been mediated, most exceptionally by socio-cultural forces that were not exclusive to the region. Group perceptions in the San Luis Valley were structured around ideas that circulated in the nation as a whole. The US war with Mexico confirmed an American belief in Mexican backwardness that made persons of Mexican background unfit to be Americans. As my colleague Richard Lusbrook insists, perhaps nothing is more reflective of this fact than delayed statehood for New Mexico. As one US congressional subcommittee investigating statehood for the territory of New Mexico explained, quote, about two thirds of the population is of the mongrel breed known as Mexicans and harbored anti-American sentiment. They were further, quote, illiterate, superstitious, morally decadent, and indifferent to statehood. Now, New Mexico's neighbor to the north, Colorado, achieved statehood in 1876. But New Mexico, despite a much longer history of settlement and resource exploitation by first Spanish subjects and later Mexican citizens, would have to wait until 1912. That same year, Arizona gained st statehood as well, having experienced something of a delay for the same reason faced by New Mexico. As the remarks of the US Congressional Subcommittee provided above make clear, at the heart of, this, of the issue, uh, at the heart of the issue by the 20th century was the issue of race and racial stereotyping. The rise of the United States had been predicated on the demise of Spain. All persons connected to the legacy of Spain in the United States were now suspect and potentially a threat to the rise of the country unless successfully assimilated within the fold of American cultural norms. Although the black legend stemmed from perceptions among Protestants that pertain to Spain and the Spanish people, it was not racial in nature. While it contributed to the development of racial stereotypes, it was the infusion of race itself that fundamentally changed the social equation in the American Southwest. Whereas the black legend alone engendered suspicion and conflict, the racialization of difference produced violent confrontations. Shortly after the end of the Mexican-American War, Chicanos throughout the American Southwest were systematically dispossessed and relegated to a secondary economic status within the emerging regional marketplace. The racialization of the labor force, immigration policies, and the educational system produced further marginalization. Lynchings became a common occurrence, segregation the norm, and for a brief time during the 19-teens, South Texas witnessed a war of annihilation launched by both sides. In framing the encounter between differing ethnic groups well over a century ago, I argue that we have to be careful not to blatantly historicize this moment as an exceptional one. Although race is supposedly less of an issue today, the vestiges of the black legend that have survived into the present continue to dominate 
uh, the public discourse between persons of English-speaking and Spanish-speaking backgrounds, linguistic communities that owe their very existence to colonial ambitions of England and Spain nearly a half millennium ago. The stories that Americans tell about themselves and the world around them today are built on the same narratives of cultural exceptionalism and those of uh, their now long-dead ancestors. Most fascinating in this regard has been the deliberate nationalization of American identity that presupposes the very existence of immigration as the wellspring of US population growth. In its controversial book on the defining character of the American, uh, this is, this is the, the war in South Texas, uh, in his controversial 2004 uh, book on the defining character of the American people and the prospects for their future in the world, Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington decried the work ethic of Spanish, America's Spanish-speaking underclass, publicly shaming the culture of manana as its sole defining characteristic. His argument was, of course, little more than a tired rant of a man consumed by an abiding faith in the black legend as a reality of the modern world. Scholarship aside, I argue furthermore that the black legend dominates public discourse surrounding the immigration debate in this country, which at present consumes the greatest portion of the ongoing cultural dialogue between English-speaking North Americans and their Spanish-speaking counterparts. Opponents of immigration reform insist that Mexican immigrants will fail to learn English, that they will fail to adopt the supposedly American virtue of hard work, and perhaps worst of all, that they might alter the cultural fabric of the country. In short, that they will fail to assimilate to the Protestant norms which have defined the growth and, su growth and success of the United States as a great nation for the past 238 years and counting. In a 2006 airing of The Radio Factor with Bill O'Reilly, the host doubted that Mexican immigrants, quote, have any kind of traditional value system at all, vis-a-vis -vis what, what America used to be, and instead were taking their Mexican values because most of them are Mexican and, you know, basically setting up Acapulco North. In a strikingly frank manner, O'Reilly basically insisted that given the choice, Mexican immigrants would seek to recreate a beach town, largely the playground of Americans, mind you, where they could while away their time rather than work. It is not hard to hear, or in my case, to read these words and not recognize the echoes of English detractors mocking the Spanish work ethic centuries ago. Of course, O'Reilly was not alone. Later that same year, in a broadcast of the CNN show, Glenn Beck claimed, quote, at the very least, American immigrants are attacking our culture and our way of life. They are not melting into our melting pot. They are here for the cash. In a telling rant, Beck upheld the cultural superiority of the white Protestant ideal, disavowing the lessons that could be learned from other cultural points of view, and insisting that his ideal was the high point of Western civilization. At a later point in the show, Beck further insisted, uh, quote, I mean, we've got all the threats coming from overseas, but the simplest way for us to lose the culture of the West is just to do nothing and let illegal immig immigrants not melt in and take the culture away from us. Evident in such discourse is the idea that illegal immigrants are somehow bigoted in refusing to adopt the cultural norms of American society, as though it was somehow plainly evident that divine providence had bestowed superior rank on the dominant variety of cultural norms. Especially fascinating here is the idea that these same immigrants are actively attacking our culture by doing nothing at all. In presuming that Mexican immigrants have nothing to offer, Beck succumbs to much the same view as Masson de Mauvillier. After all, if the culture of Mexico is not part of the West, then where exactly does it fall? Much of such, such rhetoric clearly stems, uh, or excuse me, much of such rhetoric clearly stems from a deep-seated paranoia over the loss of American empire and the declining place of the U.S. in the world. However, the real tragedy here is that unless the body politic finds a way to circumnavigate this logic and steer around the Scylla and Charybdis of exclusion and isolationism, it will most assuredly confirm for itself a place of ignominy in the emerging global system. A sure product of religious fanaticism, the black legend was born of an imperial necessity that has no place in an increasingly digital world marked by absent borders and intercultural exchange. Continued reliance on the black legend should be seen as little more than a desperate and ill-conceived defensive mechanism presaging total irrelevance in world historical terms. <laughs> 
It is in light of this belief that I, I find it necessary to comment briefly on the situation in Jefferson County, Colorado. The local school board has taken issue with the new standards for advanced placement, or AP, US history introduced by the college board, which administers the exam and recently has seen fit to add a more critical dimension to its contact, content. In my opinion, this is a welcome change to a deeply flawed examination system. However, the school board members insist that the new standards place US history in a bad light. They have called for new material that presents the positive aspects of US history in promotion of, quote, citizenship, patriotisms, essentials and benefits to the free enterprise system, respect for authority, and respect for individual rights. Furthermore, they say this new material should not, quote, encourage or condone civil disorder, social strife, or disregard of the law. Historical accounts like that I have presented this evening would certainly fly in the face of such a directive. Americans are often squeamish to reflect on their role in the world. I would personally uh, confess a degree of insecurity uh, discussing US history in front of my Spanish colleagues. Mention of lynchings, prejudice, and racially motivated social strife are difficult topics to confront. But that should not mean that we shy away as a people from difficult conversations about the past. I am pleased to see that, it is not, that this has not been the case in Jefferson County. On Monday, over 70% of the teachers at two Jefferson County high schools walked out in protest to the proposed changes to the history curriculum. While that number also reflects dissatisfaction with an ongoing labor dispute between the teachers union and the school board, it is very significant to see such a large number of educators, and especially students, stand with the cause of protecting critical historical inquiry. It was a critical examination of the written corpus of history on Spain that allowed for the diagnosis of the black legend in the first place. Only through such means can we possibly hope to make meaningful steps forward as a nation and work towards resolution of the many long-standing social inequalities that plague the country. One of the problems with a glib account of US history, or any history for that matter, that only stresses the positive aspects of a historical narrative is that it silences the history of marginalized peoples. It overlooks the social costs inherent to historical triumph. Rather than encourage the virtues uh, of citizenship and individual rights, such a program of study yields the potential to breed complacency and so much respect for a system of authority that would render the democratic experience, or experiment excuse me, null and void altogether. Furthermore, without a critical reading of history, there is little hope that a historical trope like the black legend will disappear anytime soon. The black legend has thrived for as long as it has on a foundation of meager intellectual scrutiny and limited cultural exchange that, rather tragically, has characterized much of the history of inter-ethnic relations in this country. It would be somewhat of an overstatement to argue that we have reached a kind of turning point, but there are glimmers of hope. Educational institutions like Adams State provide a space for interrogating the origins of cultural differences and exploring routes towards social reconciliation. Coursework that promotes social understanding and encourages conscious reflection on difficult issues exhibits the potential not only to sharpen analytical and critical thinking skills, but also to produce more mindful graduates ready to engage the world in all of its diverse complexity. It is to this task, I leave you now, that we must turn as a university. So thank you. So I guess I'll open the floor for questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful presentation. All the things I've known mm -hmm. from all the things I've learned and all the things I've experienced. Mm -hmm. um, I feel as though our schizophrenic country is, well, we don't really have a choice because in 2042, our numbers are going to shift dramatically. And the thing that I see happening with students of color, 
is that they're not afraid to be educated. Those that we are allowing to be educated. Those who are, we are affording to be educated. And it is our educated children of color, I think, that will begin to shift that perception. Um, I have two kids of mixed race and three grandchildren of mixed mm -hmm. race. And in 20 years, their story, I hope, will be different. I hope they will never have to experience the racism I've experienced or that their other side of their family has experienced. Um, I think that we are in a place where we can rewrite history now into the reality and having watching the kids in Jefferson is really, it's so heartwarming to see some young people taking a stand for what is right. Yeah, I mean, just a few thoughts that come to mind. You mentioned 2042. Uh, the, the, the census uh, records indicate it might actually even much happen much earlier than that, right? Uh, but at the same time, the, the democratization of the American educational system is really not happening very quickly. Um, when I was in college, um, this might just be a reflection of, you know, youthful optimism, but I figured that we were on the cusp of really significant change. Um, Next year will be my, my ten-year college uh, reunion, and uh, I, 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 sort of reflecting on that, I went back to go look up the statistics for my alma mater, and really very little has changed. The exact percentage of underrepresented groups in the country are still at where they were ten years ago. Uh, and this is a fairly elite educational institution with deep pockets uh, to make change, and yet that hasn't really happened. Uh, I would say some state institutions in a few states, California, Michigan, uh, have made efforts, uh, but largely it's, it's gone unnoticed uh, by and large. I think in almost any bureaucratic institution you'll see the same stuck in our way of hiring the people who look like us, who act like us, who went to the schools we went to. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I have to have hope because I know that my kids are going to see the world from a completely different perspective and do see it from a completely different perspective. Let's hope that that continues to be the case. Any other thoughts or questions?